Hey, and welcome back to That Beer Show. Today, I am joined by two very special guests. Today, we have Jeremy Muirworth Hi. and James Casey. So two award-winning home brewers. Um, so we thought we'd sit down today and chat with them a little bit about homebrew festivals. Um, so kind of a new thing. Um, you know, there's a lot of regulations, blah, 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 about homebrew festivals. But I thought we'd dig in behind the scenes a little bit with these two gentlemen, especially since they are award-winning. So, guys, uh, Jeremy, I'll start with you. First of all, do you like homebrew festivals? Yeah, I think I think they're great. Um, gives me a chance to share beer with people who aren't my friends. Um, when you share beer with your friends, they're just glad to have have free beer, and they'll give you a <laughs> sure. Thing. You always and get so the they, really good compliments from exactly. the friends. So, yep. so you, it always sucks when you get the yeah, it's smooth. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so yep. being able to share it with people who aren't necessarily worried about hurting your feelings, absolutely, is, yeah. get some excellent feedback. Now, is there a certain uh, focus you have going into a festival? Do you kind of brew specifically as a style, or you know, how do you approach what to make going into a homebrew festival? Um, I, I typically pull from my my library stuff that I know okay. people people like, yep. um, and. Beyond that, I just kind of think about what time of year it is, uh, ah. what people are going to be in the mood for. Um, if it's summer, I'll go do something lighter. Um, I'm glad we had a had a winter homebrew festival this year because yep. I was able to pull out the stouts and share something I haven't been Absolutely, able to yeah. share before. Yeah, stout midsummer probably not a huge uh, you know fan favorite, but mm -hmm. great. James, same questions to you. Is a, a the homebrew festival? Is that something that you enjoy going to, or what's your feedback on on homebrew festivals? Like Jeremy said, just having the the opportunity to get your beer out into the public, um, honest opinions. I also I, I think uh, it's really good for you know the consumer as well. Yes. Because I mean bragging rights on trying homebrewed beer, you know, compared to what they try in stores, uh, they may be able to try a lot more beers than their friends and family could. And sure. Um, so yeah, it's it's a it's it's a good. And what's your focus going in? Similar to Jeremy's, where you know you look at time of year and things like that. Um, how yeah. do you determine what to brew? Uh, m mostly seasonal as well. Um, I don't like to. I don't like to brew this, you know, same beer uh, f for uh, the same competition. Sure. Um, I like to switch it up. Cool. Um, you know, and, and try to bring something uh, off kilter. I suppose. Sure. Something to uh, uh, surprise the crowd. I suppose. What's impressed me mostly about the homebrew festival, especially the ones that we've had here locally, is the quality of beer across the board. Um, you know, I know a lot of the home brewers, but the the quality, the diversity that you know you home brewers are bringing is really incredible to me, and I, I think um, that's really what spurred the whole craft beer movement. Mm -hmm. You know, if you look and, and talk to certain breweries, a lot of them started as home brewers. Mm -hmm. You know, and then I think as the home brewing hobby grew, so did the craft beer market grow. So I think that's kind of a cool, cool aspect. So. Um, what's the general vibe at these homebrew fests? I'm sure it uh, varies from one to the other, <laughs> but uh, how would you uh, summarize the, the vibe at a some of these general events? sense of inebriation. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so yep. There's a lot, lot of happy people. Sure. Um, so. Yep. So you know, you know these. I find that the people that come to these festivals, yeah, they're definitely having a good old time. Um, but I find that they definitely attract the craft beer fan. Absolutely. Which is kind of cool. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, this is just an example of some of the tasters that you might find at a, at a homebrew festival. As you can see, it's a four ounce pour. Um, so a lot of my, you know, going to these things as well is I'm finding that these people are fairly conscious about it as well, which is kind of cool to see. You know, a lot of people think beer fest, they think, oh, it's a frat party, that kind of right, thing. Right. So um, it's great when you go to a beer fest and you have a peanut butter stout and a Sour Patch Kid beer and all these, you know, very unique um, 
kind of beers, which you could go to a brewery or several breweries and never hit any of these sure. styles at all. Um, so that's pretty cool. And the attendees aren't afraid to try them either. No. That's, that's the that's the fun yeah. part too. Is like if you put a sour patch beer in a bar, I'm sure a lot of people would walk in and be like, "What the oh, heck?" Exactly. exactly. But the, because, like you said, because of the attendees, they're very craft beer focused. They're sure. not afraid to try something with a little little mm -hmm. off kilter, a little yeah. off center. Absolutely. In, in a way, I almost feel like if you did uh, bring like a cream ale or, yeah. or just a regular pale ale, that you probably wouldn't do so well, even so if it, even if it wasn't nailed to style. People sure. are actually looking for a more unique beer experience where Absolutely. you know they can have a cream ale or a, a pale ale or this, that, and the other. So, and I think that's a testament to again the home brewers really you know bringing it and and upping their game. So, so what do you guys got fermenting right now? Um, in my basement right now, I have a, a cream ale. Just with, just <laughs> cause I'm, I'm You're not going to bring it to the competition. Nah, I'm, I I'm just getting ready for uh, lawnmower season. I know yep. I'm, yeah, I want something a nice thirst quencher. Sure. Um, yep, another batch of the peanut butter chocolate stout is so that's going to be a beer great. you're going to have to brew for the rest it's of your life. Yeah, gonna be, absolutely. It's going to be in the in the in the keg uh, next week. But yeah. yeah, it's exactly it. After the after the contest, everybody's like, oh, I got to try some right. of that. So yeah. like, well, I got no. Quick question: Are you changing the recipe? Um, I might tweak it a little bit. I'm always, you know, yep. when it, whenever I taste it, it's always something a little, I'm tend to be my, always, my own worst critic. I hear you. Um, it's good to be. Yes. Um, I'm thinking about maybe making it with lactose to give it some, yep. a little more nice creaminess or yeah. Sweet, yeah. sweetness. Yeah. Sure. Um, but right now I'm just kind of keeping it. Try it and like, Okay, this is, this is the award-winning recipe. Let's yeah. just Absolutely. Mark, mark that yep. down. Absolutely. <laughs> James, what do you got uh, fermenting away these days? All I have right now is a uh, blackberry porter. Oh, nice. Yeah, so okay. I'm just, and to answer your question, from before yep. is just a uh, different uh, blackberry additions, different times. Yeah. Um, I actually didn't do any blackberries in a boil, ah. just in secondary. Um, Interesting. Now, when you're doing that, I have to get too technical for the beer people out there. But are you uh, are you sanitizing the fruit in any way? So putting it in the secondary? Or are you? Th this uh, actually, this one I just froze it. Oh, okay. Um, so that's gonna kill yeah. off any yeah. kind of bugs or anything yep. like that. And breaks breaks up the the membrane and. Yep. Really releases a lot of those flavors Absolutely. out there. Yeah. Very I wanted cool. to. I'm, I'm sorry. No. I wanted to use the the fruit harvest like that comes in the cans. Yeah, the puree. Yeah, yeah I'm pretty familiar with that. Yeah, but, but I, j I just figured on a homebrew level, I can. I was able to use fresh blackberries. Perfect. You know, so. Yeah, very cool. I know as a homebrewer myself, you know, um, look for local ingredients. I actually started growing my own lemon thyme, nice. so different herbs and things like that. So I know a lot of folks, especially time around this time of year, they're going to start brewing rhubarb beers and things nice. like that. Yeah. So that's really yeah. keeping within the homebrew spirit, you mm -hmm. know, is, is that kind of thing. Well, thank you guys. I know that seems pretty quick, but uh, um, any final last thoughts? Um. Can't wait for the summer. Yeah, come, <laughs> awesome. come to Bennington Brew Fest. They're amazing. Awesome. They're really fun. Absolutely. Yeah, so James alluded to, so we have the Four Corners North Home Brew Fest coming up August 5th here in Bennington, Vermont. So you can hop on Facebook or on the website and, and check those out. So. So today we're going to talk about pale ales, IPAs, and double IPAs. Big question that we always get is, what's the difference between a pale ale, an IPA, and a double IPA? There's a lot of different variances and nuances, but I'm going to break it down real simple for you. So let's talk about a pale ale. So a pale ale is typically 4% to around 6%, and usually around 25 IBUs to 45, 50-ish. Now I say ish because you know these standards are always drifting. You can get a pale ale that's 60 IBUs, but in general, um, that's kind of where it lies. Now an IPA itself is typically 6% to 7, 7.5%. And anywhere from 45 to 50 IBUs, all the way up to right around 75, 80-ish. Which brings us to our double IPA, so the big boy of the bunch. Um, they are typically 8% and higher in ABV, and usually around 85 IBUs, all the way up to 200 IBUs. So how does that translate to flavor and taste and all that good stuff? So a pale ale is usually light, crisp, fairly easy drinking. Maybe dry hopped, but probably not, so it has more of a malty aroma. 
IPAs, you know, a little bit more alcohol, a little bit more body, obviously more hop presence, um, and definitely dry hop. So you're going to get a big aroma and you work into double IPAs, a lot more alcohol. So a lot more sweeter, maltier, still fairly high hop presence and definitely also dry hop. When you're in the bar, you're trying to decide exactly what you want to drink. Um, remember pale, light, crisp IPA right in the middle, double IPA, usually a little heavier and a little bit more hop presence. All right. And now we reach that fun part of the show where we get to sample some beers. So I have with me Ryan Scott. How's it going? It's going well. And also Ross Richards. It's awesome to be here. So you guys have a, a tough job time. today. A tough yeah. job today. Someone's got to do it. I hear you. So today we're going to dive into some more refreshing beers. Um, as the warm weather starts to emerge, um, I think your palate shift a little bit from some heavier stouts, porters, mm -hmm. barley wines, box, um, and you start getting into some more refreshing beers. So today we're going to sample three beers, um, and they all have a theme. Any uh, you, you you gentlemen wanna wanna guess what we might be sampling today? I see the word sour here. Ah. Yes, I do. I, I see some sour beer in front of me. It gave it away for us, right? It was a little easy does, one for you. It was, you know, you, you passed the test. So yeah, today we're gonna sample a few sour beers, and each of them have a unique twist on them. So I say, without further ado, we uh, we dive right in. So the first one today is going to be the Blackberry Short Vice from Smutty Nose. So a nice regional brewery here in the Northeast. Um, so without further ado, we will crack it open. I love that sound. Mm. And Ross, I know uh, you know a little bit about the vices, if you will. So you want to give the folks just a, a quick little description as I pour here? Yeah, Berliner V's very straightforward, simple beer. Easy to brew, just as easy to drink. Uh, a lot of them <laughs> like that. have no boil to them at all. Really? They just use lactic That's acid. That's interesting. A lot of times from the grain itself. Nice. Naturally has the, the bacteria on it. No boil. So you mm. ferment it with that. You throw in very, very little hops because hops will actually mm -hmm. be detrimental to this kind of beer and will, will kill it. Destroys the flavor or does it ruin the chemistry? It'll actually stop the lactobacillus from doing its job of fermenting the that product. That makes sense. Yep. So you'll get a, a stalled fermentation or altogether stopped. So they definitely keep those below 13 IBUs, very low on the scale. Hardly even detectable, and isn't it? super light, super refreshing, low alcohol, easy to drink with just a nice tart sourness typically. So this one actually weighs in at 4.8%. Um, interesting, they actually printed the ABV on the bottom of the can. Mm, only? So, yeah. So per batch, I would guess. I'm guessing, yeah. It's a short series batch, so it said to check the bottom. Um, oh, nice. You know, for the ABV and also the date, which in a future episode, we'll dive into that. Nice. Um, a little tip for, for the viewers. Absolutely. So yeah, you can see this color. So it's we did say it's huh? blackberry. So obviously the berries are throwing some, some nice flavor there. It's pretty active too. It's, uh, it's lots very of crisp, lots of carbonation in there so I'm gonna go right in get that smells great get the sourness right up front man clean though clean sourness. Yes, very this clean. is a breakfast beer if I've ever smelled one absolutely have this with some oatmeal a lot of little bubbles in this you can you can see it's Seriously. very effervescent before you even try it so again that really harkens back to clean crisp hmm warm weather lawnmower beer. Now, a lot of people I know, they go into the stores and they're very nice. tentative to get a sour beer. Yeah. You know, sour beers are, are just kind of emerging um, into the mainstream. Now, mm -hmm. they've been around forever and a lot of people have enjoyed them for a long time, but I think mainstream beer drinkers are starting to really start to dive into these. And People probably think sour like sour candy, like yep. an off-putting flavor, don't yep. they? This has a... Uh, Pretty intense tartness, but I wouldn't say it's overly sour. No, no, um, that, that's the style. Right. I think so. the fruit offsets it just enough. That's a good point. Yep. Yeah, nice balanced. I've I've had raspberry Berliner Vs. I've had straight Berliner Vs. It's the first time I've ever had it with this particular fruit, and it it really balances it much that's better cool. than just a straight Berliner, which tends to be more sharp. Exactly, and I think this is a great crossover beer. So, you know, you might be tentative to bring a sour beer to a party or a gathering yeah. or something like that. But I think uh, I think even probably the novice beer drinker would 
at least appreciate it. Females, I think, would, would love this, who, who typically aren't necessarily huge beer drinkers. Uh, I think they would they would love something like this, especially the crisp tartness of the berry. Mm -hmm. um, perfect, perfect summertime uh, I could beer. see this being great for wine drinkers as well. Absolutely. There's definitely, it reminds me of a wine without being a wine. I mean, it's obviously not. People who enjoy cider as well. Oh, I good think point. this would be, uh, definitely. you know. So again, you could reach across the spectrum of beer drinkers. Delicious. Yeah, I mean, we are talking about sours. I think this is probably a good transition into sours, as you were referring to as well. Absolutely, it's a good gateway to uh, to Ooh, a sour gateway. beer. Yep. To this to... is the gateway sour. Right yeah, there. it absolutely is. So, so great job to to Smutty Dose. They do a smoked peach, really? which would be very interesting to try. I didn't so, know you could smoke peaches. I wonder I what that what that does. Just about anything, huh? So. <laughs> Pushing innovation, craft absolutely. beer. Absolutely. Yeah. Very good for summertime work. Mow the lawn, drink a few of these, not get too schnookered that you crooked lines in the grass. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Excellent. We're going to switch Very gears good. now. Beer by Hermit Thrush. Now, they're a brewery out of Brattleboro, Vermont. So what's cool about Hermit Thrush, this is pretty unusual, at least in the breweries um, here in the Northeast, is they only brew sour beers. A lot of their beers, if not all, are barrel, barrel aged. Awesome. So that's commitment too. So very interesting. So I know that work goes into yeah keeping that beer alive. Climate going. control, really, right? Hermit Thrush Brewery uses historical brewing processes, oak casks, and new green technologies to make exciting beer while minimizing environmental impacts. Uh, exclusively awesome. wild harvested yeasts. We highlight local flavors, ingredients in each of our beers. So you can see they really have this commitment to uh, to local. Each four-star series beer is a sour pale ale featuring a single hop variety picked just hours before ending up in our beer. Yeah, so clearly they're using a wet hop process. Mm -hmm. I was about uh, to mention it. It must be know, wet hop if it's going yeah, right from the right. farm to them. Exactly. So um, Brown's Brewing out of Troy, New York. Gary also, Brown. Gary Brown also does um, a very well-received wet hopped pale ale. So he utilizes locally grown hops fresh that day, which is kind of cool from the brewing side is the brewers really are cool. basically sitting at the brew house, you know, actually brewing the beer and it has to be some pretty good timing. So like when they're ready to use those hops, hops need to come and they use them in the process. So um, it's a very unique kind of niche thing. Obviously you're only doing it around harvest time Yep. because um, as soon as you pick that hop cone, it just starts to degrade right down. So without further ado. And from my experience, the wet hop, you get more earthy tones out of your hops. Yep. Yeah. And I think mixing that with wood age and sour, I, I think it could be really interesting. I have a feeling we're going to enjoy this one. It's a super clear. That's a pretty looking beer, huh? This is a typical color you'd see in a Berliner Wies. It is. That's Definitely on the so lighter right. color, so I gotta believe uh, it's pilsen. your base malts more. Yeah. Um, if there's crystal or chocolate or specially malts in this, it, it's little to none, it's, yeah. It would shock me. Who can slightly cloudy, yeah. Slightly. Do you think that's just the uh, maybe some residual hops, or do you think it's the malt choice, or what are you what are you thinking? Could be a number of things. The yeast being used could be one. Um, I I gotta believe it's with the yeast. I know, it shouldn't be the hops. Every right? time I've it's done a Berliner Wies, it they all come out this color. Just a with slight, really? the souring process. Oh, okay. It they come out just slightly hazy as this one is. Oh yeah, you could definitely. You definitely see the difference. Now, it, it smells mm. somewhat similar to the smutty nose without the fruit. Which is interesting, yeah. You know, if, if you take that fruit out of that one, it tastes... You can sort of differentiate, too. Some nice sourness up front. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's that's great. So, a little more sour. It is. A little more puckering. I can mm. taste the malts, though, nicely. Certainly not over the top in any way. Um, a little bit different than the, the Berliner Weiss. Um... Again, very clean. Mm -hmm. You do. You are getting a little bit of malt in there. Just enough. Just enough. And for the low amount of hops in this, you are getting just a small undercurrent of the hops, which is which is cool because that's kind of what they want to do with this beer yeah, you, is to showcase. The, you catch the flavor of the hop at the same time when you do that that sourness of the beer, which is a great way to showcase this project with the wet hop exactly. strategy. It, it tastes to me to be more of a, a well-rounded definitely sourness as opposed to the sharpness of a Berliner. And both are great, yeah. you know, but it's it's very different. It's subtle. Yeah, I think the sour flavor comes from many sources here. And I think it's 
well executed, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. These guys definitely know what they're doing with the sour beers. Um, you know, again, it's a little bit more sour, but it's very clean. It's crisp. It's refreshing. Um, definitely another lawnmower beer. Mm. Um, That's a good term. You know, absolutely. That should be a segment later on in the show, lawnmower beers. I think we'll have to do our top summer lawnmower beers. It's always interesting to me because I have a hard time mixing sour beers and hops. They just seem yeah. polar opposites to me. Um, so when a lot of breweries, brewers in general, started this trend, I had a little bit of trepidation. But I got to be honest, boy, they're really um, yeah. uh, they're balancing it out fine, and um, this is this is great. One of the things but, I'm noticing out there in the craft beer industry is definitely the technique, because as we discussed earlier, if you throw hops yeah. in with Lactobacillus it will destroy that. It'll stop it from fermenting at, at a certain because level. Because hops are a preservative. So there's, there's other, you know, there's, you can sour mash. You can, mm -hmm. you can sour the keg. You can sour so many different parts of the beer to play around. So if you want to add yeah. a lot of hops or, you know, like this, this has a good hop flavor. It does. That I don't think Lactobacillus would have been able to survive. Right. But they have other ways of souring it. Wild yeast, brett, um, but just the techniques that are out there yeah. and the different ways of souring, you, you basically got to talk to the brewer. You could never guess what they're doing. Yeah, and I can only guess by what's printed on the can, which is basically that they're harvesting their own wild yeasts, um, which is interesting. And if that's the case with this beer, Dedication kudos too. because, you know, definitely, you know, to be able to capture and harvest a wild yeast that throws these kind of flavors and, you know, a and nice... control it. Exactly. You definitely nice get into the science sourness. side of that brewing you know, process on that. So. Awesome stuff. We're going to go on to number three here, and boy, I don't need, wow. So this brings up a pretty cool point, which is this whole genre, if you will, of can art. Mm -hmm. Now, gone are the days of the, you know, red and white can and very generic and this, that, just and the a, other. Just text and... Absolutely. Yeah. So... You have to speak out these days. I mean, There's so many options for craft that's beer, cool. right? Yeah, you know, and that that artwork, it's Can I check that? It, it stands out. It's good. Look at that. It's beautiful. It's, that's wonderful artwork. That's that's wonderful cool. artwork. Well, I it, can see the artist putting their energy in. It's this, at least you know? gonna bring one of us over and say, "What is that?" Just to get someone to come over and check out. The label um, alone can raise awareness for your oh, beer, yeah. even if they're not oh, buying yeah. your beer. So this it's is from. A talking point. Yep, this is from Collective Project. Um, this is a dry hop sour. So they didn't give us much more to go on, so we're going to go ahead and... We just have to taste it and find out the go. rest. Oh, right. Now, I believe this is a dry hop sour? Dry hop sour. That's that's creative, and it's it is. art in another form. I think this just puts right. more obvious art along with the the art of craft <laughs> brewing. There's a kitty who wants to also sample yes. the beer. I mean, she must know that we're having a good time in here, so... Yeah. Oh, so there's some wow. hops. So there's the dry hops, right? <laughs> wow! Wow is the response to the smell. That was that was cool that we all like our eyes lit up. Wow. Unbelievable hoppiness. I, this is something I never I would even expect in a sour beer. Yeah. I've had a bunch of sours. I don't think I've ever had one that was this Man. pungent on the nose for hops. It's if it invites you in. What does this smell like to you guys? Sorry. In terms of what kind what of hop? What does it remind you of? Like. I don't know, from a, an aroma standpoint. Honestly, this brings me back to summer's past where you, you're standing in your garden with mm. hops growing right behind you. You're yeah, brewing outside and you're just doing an addition of hops and you can smell it just percolating out of this the oil. This does remind me of a brew. It smells it, like early stages of a brew. It, so another cool, yes. uh, another cool observation, mm. another, you know, slightly wow. cloudy beer. Yep. You know, it's not quite clear. Um, it's light, obviously. Now, right. I've noticed our carbonation level seems to be boosted it's higher active. on yeah. all of these beers yeah. than you'd normally see. Yeah. These, these bubbles are running and think, marathons. Here. And I think that's a testament to the Look ABV. So this one is also five. Okay. You know, so they, they really are going for this crisp, clean, um, you know. Just I don't even want to taste it yet. I want to just look at it. I can smell that. <laughs> It's definitely a pungent hop that they're Man. using to dry hop this with, so. It smells like food, flowers, and a garden, and a hot, warm summer day, all in the same glass. The beer just dissipates in your mouth and leaves behind really awesome citrus flavors wow. that... I, just, I gotta go in I, for another. I don't even know yeah. what I got in that first one. It was explosion of flavors, taste. yeah. There is a combination of flavors just dancing on the tongue. 
That is excellently done. I get some light sourness. Like, I think this may be the lightest sour that I've tasted out of the two. And do you think some of that is from the hops balancing it so well? Balancing it, yep, knocking it down just a touch. Pulls the attention away from the sour. Yeah. Um, What's cool is the hops don't Mm. overpower, though. You, you, You know, from that aroma, I thought... You know, we might be drinking a pale ale or That's, an IPA. Yeah. Exactly. Um, I don't get that on the taste at all. I get it definitely in the aroma. Quite often, I see a higher carbonation level on sours. And really? Okay. Yep. That makes sense. A in lot general, of different beers, yep. you're going to aim for different carbonation levels. You wouldn't want your stout carbonated to the level exactly. of, you say, want a, a Pilsner. You, you know? don't want it. Exactly. Because your carbonation, the size of the bubbles, all mm-hmm. that comes into play with mouthfeel, texture, even the flavor. This evaporates in your mouth it does and just leaves behind the flavor without any cloyingness or sweetness left behind it's just really dry easy to drink and invites you to take another sip that i think that lends to the drinkability as you're referencing as well and i could see this really going well you're having a cookout you have some fruit salad and some burgers you have some potato salad and some potato chips yep very different flavors all balanced really well with this beer so I think we really picked three beers that, one, complement each other very well, mm. Um, mm. and two, really fit into that light, crisp, yep. crossover, lawn mower beer. Like these, I could drink these all day at a picnic. All reasonably priced. I think this was in the $11, $12 range. Which I is think. pretty reasonable for a craft four-pack yep. pints. And you There's get what you pay for a yep. lot of times exactly. in the brewing world. There's a reason why some beers are $12 and some are $20. Yes. There's a reason behind it. It's not price gouging. It's not anything like that. It's, it costs more to brew the beer. It costs more. And if you're yeah. going to go to the grocery store, it's the same premise. So yep. I think that wraps up our session summer sour series say that fast i like that say that again uh, <laughs> session summer sour series bam i heard session sour oh no yeah see how you got i don't know what i couldn't get the first time uh, i hear that though so yeah next time you're at the store remember one there's a lot more sour beers out there now we do live in somewhat of a beer mecca here in southern vermont um Mm -hmm. which we're very proud of and very happy to be in Um, so that might not be across the board but search out some sours search out i would recommend some lower abv sours give them a try i think uh the lightness the crispness the drinkability of them you know and if you don't like it you don't like it you tried something new and you Mm -hmm. and you move on so all right that's going to wrap it up for this segment of That Beer Show. All right, today we're going to take a look at my favorite glass, all time favorite, the Duval glass. So Duval is a awesome beer company. They produce a Belgian strong ale, which is fantastic. So I highly recommend you give that a try, but let's talk about this glass. So oversized tulip glass, as you can see, very sturdy. Um, What I love about this glass is its size. So what I typically like to do, even with 12 or 16 ounce pours, you can fill it right in there. You have this nice little headspace, perfect for aroma. Um, When I really want to capture an aroma on a beer, I go to this glass just because it gives you that opportunity to do your swirl, an aggressive swirl. Get right in there with your nose. Works perfect for that. Also, it's very sturdy. Kind of overlooked in the beer glass world, but, you know, as you're drinking beer, obviously you're putting it down, you're picking it up a lot. You want something that feels comfortable in the hand, and this certainly does it. One other very cool aspect of this glass, it has an etching on there. So it has actually a D etched in there. So what does etching do? What etching does is as you pour your beer in, it's gonna release a little bit more of that carbonation. The bubbles are actually going to attach right to that etching and release. So as the beer is in there, you'll see this stream, almost like a pillar of carbonation come right up from that D and Duval. What's that do? It's also going to release more aromas. It's also going to keep that beer crisp. So as you're drinking, as you're swirling, that beer is passing over that D, releasing all the great aromas and flavors and tastes that we want. So absolute go-to beer glass you can put anything in this you can put a stout in this you can put a porter in this you can put an ipa in this you can put a sour in this 
put any kind of beer in this glass and it's super appropriate for it. So what I like to do is I actually have a whole collection of these. I have about six. So when I'm doing a beer sampling, a beer tasting, I'll lay them all right out and, uh, and we'll pour right in these. Um, so that wraps up this, this beer glass segment. If you don't have one of these glasses, I highly recommend you go out and get one now. Thank <laughs> you.